for the very first volume of the New Thinking Aloud Dialogue series, Is There Life After Death? Publication date is June 1st. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is psychotronics. With me is Dr. Beverly Rubick, who is the president of the United States Psychotronics Association. Beverly is a biophysicist. She is the founder and director of the Institute for Frontier Science in Oakland, California, and is the author of over a hundred scientific papers on subtle energies, psychic healing, uh, the mysterious properties of water and other uh, frontier areas of science. Welcome, Beverly. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's my pleasure. I first heard of the term psychotronics after reading uh, Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain. I think there was a chapter in that book, which was published back in the 1960s, uh, about work going on in Czechoslovakia. And uh, I gather that uh, the term caught on and there was an international association and then the American Association. And so, for the past half century, people have been working in this mysterious area. Yes. The original psychotronics was a remake of parapsychology by mm -hmm. the Czech group because they felt it was a little mystical or, or it had um, a bad reputation. So, they mm -hmm. wanted to rescue it. They also started to move into studying devices, shapes, such as pyramids and really new inventions mm -hmm. uh, to which they applied intent. So, the word psychotronics really means uh, mind and machine, mm -hmm. mind and device. So, it's all about the mind-machine interface, at least mm -hmm. originally. Now, uh, I mean, this goes back to ancient times in a way. Uh, there are uh, what were known as amulets. People uh, carried special uh, charms and devices and uh, uh, signias and uh, so forth, even uh, special clothing with uh, various images uh, on it for purposes of warding off evil spirits and the like. Absolutely. And I think in the past when we had more handiwork, people put something of themselves in the mm -hmm. very creations that they made, and they believed that uh, there were some special properties as a result of mm -hmm. their intention uh, being imbued in the matter. Mm -hmm. And, and of course, mystics throughout history have worked with objects, whether it's crystal balls or specially uh, charged uh, wands or holy water, uh, all of uh, the in interaction between the human being and various uh, material substances or, or devices g goes back a long way. Dowsing rods are also another example. Yes, the original willow mm -hmm. uh, that people walked around uh, to find water that mm -hmm. they say simply moved. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but in reality, I don't think there's any special property to the matter per se. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's something about the coupling uh, between the human being and the device. Well, there's no question that humans can augment their natural abilities by various devices. Uh, I, simplest one is a pencil. If I have a pencil, I can perform complex mathematical operations. My brain is doing all the work, but without the pencil, it would be quite hard. Yes, that's a very good example. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and there are devices uh, used in radionics yeah. that look extremely complicated, that involve a witness where you take uh, a snippet of fingernail or hair or sometimes a photograph of, of uh, the target, it might be a person, might be an agricultural field, mm -hmm. place it into a well, and then um, they assess it to look for what rates, what so-called frequencies mm -hmm. might influence it. 
Actually, they first uh, try to assess what's wrong with it, and then they assess rates to which they will broadcast mm -hmm. uh, apparently some subtle energy to the target to yeah. effectively produce uh, the desired change, health or mm -hmm. improved yields, etc. Now, you and I both knew Arthur M. Young, who was a mentor of mine, right. the inventor of the Bell helicopter, who was an avid student of radionics. That's interesting about mm -hmm. Arthur, yes. And mm -hmm. he, I remember he used the Brunler scale yes. to evaluate one's development, mm -hmm. which was very intriguing. And he worked very closely with uh, Francis Farley, who was a uh, skilled and even famous radionics practitioner. Yes. And I learned from her, this was her attitude, that the machine was, the radionics device mm -hmm. to her was nothing more than training wheels. Mm -hmm. And once she got to a certain point, she didn't need it anymore, just like someone learning to ride a bicycle. Yeah. So you need the training wheels to balance, and then you eventually you can ride a bike without. Mm -hmm. But there are really a couple of other viewpoints on this. Yeah. Um, there are people who believe it's all in the mind, it's all about us and our abilities and simply extending mm -hmm. them a little help to focus yeah. in the device. And there are those who are the gearheads yeah. who think it's all in the devices. And then there are those who think, meh, it's a little bit of both. Well, I'm inclined to take a pragmatic approach to, to this. And, it, you know, if it works for somebody, if they're getting results, then uh, and their belief system, whatever it may be, is part of the system that produces those results, then for those people, that belief system is true, even if it's not true for someone else. I think that's very important. I would agree. Mm -hmm. Because people have taken... Uh, even uh, visual diagrams of radionics machines drawn on paper. So there's yeah. really no circuits. Yeah. Um, and um, they're just simply pen lines showing uh, struct schematics. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they use this in the same manner. And as long as they believe it, it works. But if there was a line missing which they thought should be there, it didn't work. Uh -huh. So there you go. There's the biology of belief again. Well, we, we do know that belief is very powerful. The placebo effect is, is one of the most powerful effects in all of medicine, uh, for example. So, uh, And the human mind is quite mysterious. And some of these psychic procedures are very complex. You have to go through a, a certain recipe step by step by step in order to get the right result. And to have a device that can help guide you through those steps, I think, uh, is useful. Absolutely. Yes. So there's a little bit of the target, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's a banana or a picture of your agricultural field that yeah. goes into a well. Mm -hmm. So you can focus on that. Yeah. And then you, um, you have a way of asking questions, yes or no, by running your fingers over a plate and looking for a yes, which would be a stickiness, and mm -hmm. a no, which would be a smoothness. Yeah. But actually, the original dowsing I heard was two fingers together, and a stickiness meant a yes, and a smoothness meant a no. Uh -huh. So you didn't really need an instrument. It's right here. Mm -hmm. Well, one could say that the most sophisticated psychotronic instrument of all is, is our biological organism. Right. That's right. We have right. enormous capability right here in our own bodies. Indeed. Far more than we could comprehend. Yes. But again, we live in a world in which it's mm -hmm. not so commonly considered. Yeah. So we need a little help. I think that's what. And I know also your research entails looking at questions like uh, how, how do certain shapes, like a pyramid shape or a spiral shape, uh, how do they structure the space within them? And, and are there unusual properties uh, when space is structured by shape? Yes, this is a key question. And Many years ago, science believed in the ether. Mm -hmm. and the ether, the luminiferous ether, as it was called in science, uh, was a primordial substance, very, very, very subtle, uh, that filled space mm -hmm. and that could be structured. And that was the medium through which light waves traveled and radio waves and all the radiant energies of the universe. Mm -hmm. But there were some key experiments uh, by Michelson and Morley that didn't show the extent of what was expected to be called ether drag. Right. And so science threw out 
this ether, mm -hmm. but I think we actually need a concept that space has a physicality to it. It is not empty. It's not really a vacuum. Mm. Even in quantum theory, there's a zero point energy. Yes. And it's considered a random motion of primordial, primordial particles mm -hmm. that, um, maybe we can extract energy from someday. But according to conventional science, we would need energy in order to organize this random mass of particles moving. Mm -hmm. So they don't go there. But mm -hmm. I think, um, already the ether has some structure. It's not all purely random. So mm -hmm. it's um, a very interesting area, uh, mind, matter, and ether. These, these fundamental questions in science mm -hmm. always come back. And I realize as a scientist, we don't know fundamentally what really is matter. We don't know fundamentally what really is mind, mm -hmm. and we don't really know about space and time either. We have some ideas, and we've inherited a lot of the cosmologies from Einstein. Mm -hmm. But even Einstein held the idea of an ether. It wasn't the naive ether of the times before him, but uh, there are papers by Einstein that mention ether. I see. Yes. Well, one of the great pioneers today in the field of psychotronics is uh, Dr. William Tiller, former professor of material science at Stanford University. He's been working in exotic areas like dowsing and psychotronics for decades, and he's, he's come up with some uh, amazing devices. Yes, he has something called an intention host device, or mm -hmm. IHD. And so, an electronic circuit, it looks like a black box, actually. And in one of his white papers on his website, you can find at least some details of the schematic. Mm -hmm. And he has people uh, program these devices. I believe it's a group of meditators <laughs> who focus on a specific intention as they meditate around this device, which is at that time not hooked into a circuit, but mm -hmm. just placed in the middle of a group. Mm -hmm. And so, they imbue it with their intention. And then he may send this device to another laboratory along with a control device and labeled uh, in such a way that they don't know which is the sham device or which was the program device. Mm -hmm. And then they use the device in a circuit and they look for an effect. Mm -hmm. For example, he had programmed his IHD to uh, increase the acidity of water. Increase the P, uh, decrease the pH or increase the pH, make it more alkaline. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, results show, and they're highly statistical significantly. So P less than 0 0.01 or uh, 001, uh -huh. uh, that this can be done and that mind can somehow imbue intent into a device, mm -hmm. a circuit type device that later um, can can store this information, be shipped to another laboratory, and show a physical effect. Mm -hmm. So that's a really remarkable thing, and very well controlled. You have to trust Dr. Tiller's work mm -hmm. because um, because he's a really good scientist, and he's done this for 30, 40 years. Well, that's very interesting, and uh, it, it strikes me that it's a little bit reminiscent of uh, what is known in parapsychology as... Um, not psychotronics, but psychometrics, where or psychometry, where a uh, a gifted psychic can hold in their hand an object, typically, let's say, from an archaeological dig, an ancient object, and the imp there are impressions that they read from the object, so they can describe its history, how it was used. Uh, it's as if uh, the people who handled that object maybe centuries or millennia ago, have left impressions on the object itself. So, somehow material is storing information, mm -hmm. and space can do this as well. Tiller talks about conditioned space, where you do something over and over again, and one wonders if that <laughs> isn't how uh, special sacred sites um, uh, seem to always have healings at places oh, like yeah. Lourdes mm -hmm. or the Ganges. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it? Is it the power of many healings that have occurred there as well as the miracle that may have started it all? One well, uh, we have this concept uh, called numinosity. It's used in many different contexts where if you go to a sacred site, uh, the pyramids in Egypt, people all seem to have a certain reaction 
there or, or certain cathedrals that are centuries old where, you know, people have been going to these locations and entering into altered states of consciousness. One might even say higher states of consciousness over centuries. So, these places become imbued with a, a, a sense of, of the numinous, the mm. inner essence, the, you could even say the spiritual quality of these places. We know uh, they make good remote viewing targets. A, a, a cathedral is a much better remote viewing target, for example, than a warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Well, I've done some studies on the pyramid shape. Yeah. Um, and it's just simply made out of uh, wooden, um, uh, the outline, bare outline of the pyramid with mm -hmm. a two inch uh, pine. Yeah. And they were four foot in diameter, and mm -hmm. we used pyramids to study. Uh, to see germination and plant growth. Uh -huh. And we also did uh, an arm of that experiment was to look at how uh, psychic healing across distance of space and time might also influence the plants. So yeah. we had four groups of plants, uh, total control, no pyramid, no healing. We had a group of healers send into the future intention to make these plants grow better. Mm -hmm. And then we had the pyramid alone and we had the pyramid coupled with the healers. Mm -hmm. And the net result is this. We didn't see the seeds grow, uh, germinate any faster. They all germinated at the same rate. However, the healer treated, and it was treated a month before the actual seeds were planted. Uh -huh. So that's, and it was about 2,000. Precognitive healing. <laughs> it was 1,000 miles away from my laboratory where I ran a workshop uh -huh. at uh, a conference in Boulder, uh, Colorado. Precognitive distant healing. Precognitive distant healing. <laughs> and so we got about 21% mm -hmm. uh, more biomass in those plants. Yeah that were healer treated 19% more biomass in the pyramid treated plants and over 31% increase in biomass when we combined pyramid with energy uh, healer intent. Mm -hmm. So it seemed to show a synergistic effect. It yeah. seemed to boost the influence of conscious mm -hmm. intent. Well, the problem I imagine that you, you would have sharing that research with people is that it's sort of mind blowing. And when we talk about precognitive distant healing, the first reaction of, of many people, maybe most people is that's impossible. That can't happen. And therefore, uh, there must be something wrong with what you did or with how you're interpreting it. Well, all I can say is these are the numbers and they are yeah. statistically significant. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I know it seems outrageous, but we have to think again about fundamentals here. Mm -hmm. And because consciousness uh, probably has a real existence outside of space-time as we know it in this mm -hmm. dimension, I think that's the only way it can be possible. One uh, might refer to the ancient Vedantic scriptures uh, that suggest that space and time themselves emerge out of consciousness. Einstein said that space and time were, were not real, but conditions in which we mm -hmm. find ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if I recall correctly, Immanuel Kant and his critique of pure reason suggests that space and time are categories imposed on reality by our brains and nervous system, uh, uh, that they're unique to us and maybe not to the universe itself at all. We see things according to uh, the way our biological systems are structured. Yes. And, I, and earlier we were talking about psychometry. You know, I had a remarkable experience of that, which goes beyond ordinary space and time. Someone once handed me a rock and said, what are your impressions? It was really a very ordinary looking yeah. desert rock. Uh -huh. And I actually, it, it made my hand so hot, I had to drop it. I almost... Um, hit my feet. Oh. And I said, it's so hot I can hardly hold it. Mm -hmm. I said, what's the history of this stone? They said it was in the first nuclear de bomb detonation. Oh. So that was a very hot... Because uh, you weren't picking up on the physical heat, I presume. No, it, it wasn't was a physical heat. It was probably temperature. But I have to say that it um, it began to get so warm that mm -hmm. my tendency was to drop it. Because you were tuning into the... Uh, vibrational history of the, the object itself. Yes. So, 
Many people who have uh, a knack for invention and uh, some attunement or opening to the realm of psychic possibilities are looking at various devices. And uh, these people tend to uh, congregate around the theme of psychotronics. Yes. I mean, there's groups of dowsers, for example, mm -hmm. uh, as well as other groups that just use radionics devices. There's mm -hmm. radioesthesia, which is a whole other thing. So, mm -hmm. putting pendulum over the body and oh, assessing yes. areas, uh, mm -hmm. of, um, diseases, etc. Um, but I think the pendulum is a useful tool. There's nothing magical about a bob and a string. Mm -hmm. But again, it's... Um, uh, subtle muscular movements in one direction or another will make it mm -hmm. rotate. And, yeah. and that's what people are looking for. And so a yes might be clockwise, a no might be counterclockwise. Mm -hmm. it, it depends on how you sort of program yourself via suggestion. Yes. Because it's, it's picking up on uh, the subtle autonomic uh, muscle movements. That's right. Your subconscious mind is actually uh, affecting the uh, pendulum. Yeah, and it's magnifying it mm -hmm. because it's a loose object on a string. So mm -hmm. it can magnify this twitch that you yeah. may not be able to tell. But there you go. You read the pendulum and mm -hmm. um, it gives you information. Mm -hmm. and, and people douse uh, with the pendulum, but people also douse maps. Mm -hmm. And I knew the great Terry Ross. He was a very famous uh, dowser. Uh, not only locally, but map dowser. He mm -hmm. could find water from just dowsing a map. Yeah. And how do you do that? How do you that explain adds another that? dimension. <laughs> <laughs> but so, there are dowsers who, who go with the, the fork stick and they're walking over uh, land. In fact, many people today find water through dowsing and not just water, oil and minerals as, as well. But they claim there's a real physical effect. They say, not me, my autonomic muscle movement. It's that dowsing rod is pulling me. Mm. That's how it seems to them. At I, least. And some people think certain dowsing rods shapes have mm -hmm. more efficacy than others to yeah. do the job. So yeah. there's all these varieties Lots from of individual the L rods to yeah. the one with the spring in it, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. Well, you also have people, many people, who work with crystals for yes. heal healing purposes. And yes, think I'm th thinking back to Marcel Vogel. Yeah, and I used to visit him after he made the kind of retired from IBM and he had his yeah. own laboratory and he was always using quartz crystals to do amazing things. He had a great big microscope and he would um, try to crystallize a salt solution on a glass slide while he used this crystal. But the, he used his intention to make, for example, the Virgin Mary uh, as an image crystallize in the salt. And oh. lo and behold, he could do this. Mm. And we saw it with our own eyes. Oh, he see. claimed that he needed the crystal to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually studied a few healers who used crystals in treating bacterial cultures over the years. Uh -huh. And then I said, well, let's try it without the crystal. Mm -hmm. And it didn't work so well for them. And yet, yeah. I think so much of their being is tied up with, it's about me and the crystal. Mm -hmm. And maybe the belief. And it's really hard to tease that out as a factor during right. the science. So we don't really have the answers. Uh, how much is mm -hmm. the device? How much is the person? This is a tough call. Well, one of the uh, bugaboos of parapsychology and research of this sort is what's called the experimenter effect. That if you as an experimenter have a cherished hypothesis, even if you're doing a triple blind study, uh, you could be influencing the outcome through uh, telepathy or psychokinesis. So, if you as soon as you begin to ex accept the possibility of uh, telepathy, psychokinesis being real, then, then you realize there's no way you can prevent uh, a potential experimenter effect from contaminating the results of your experiment, if it's a parapsychological experimenter effect. I know. I, I'm, we're always concerned about that. And when I did experiments like this, I always created uh, an interview form for myself. So, mm -hmm. on a given day, I would talk about how do I feel today, what are my expectations for this experiment, etc. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that from the Psy research that I've done, it's like a teamwork. Mm -hmm. You know, you bring in the psychic, but it's really about the psychic um, 
alignment and power of the group. Everybody in the system, including、yes. people in the future who will be reading your report. <laughs> I think so. It's、uh-huh. hard to draw the line when you close the laboratory door. Who else is? Has a vested interest in this experiment, who,、yeah. whose thought process may be influencing、mm-hmm. it. So it's a complex thing when we、mm-hmm. study fields <laughs> and unbounded things like consciousness. Yeah. Now we mentioned earlier that the field of psychotronics, the word psychotronics, came out of Czechoslovakia, and I know there were some、uh, remarkable results published in、uh, the early years of what they were doing. Do you have、uh, have they continued that work? Are you aware of、uh, any progress coming out of that part of the world? I don't know what's going on in the Czech Republic nowadays, but I do know that the Russians have installed a number of pyramids、mm-hmm. on oil wells,、mm-hmm. rather steep pyramids. They experimented with different angles of the pyramids. You know, the the Great Pyramid of Cheops. It's not equilateral; it's flatter,、mm-hmm. and it's based on the golden、uh, mean.、Mm-hmm. Then there's equilateral triangles. The Russians are using steep pyramids,、mm-hmm. four sided, but more like church steeples,、mm-hmm. placed on oil wells, and they claim that it decreases the oil viscosity, and so for the same amount of energy expended, they can mine more oil. Hmm. So they're using it for very practical things. And would you call that a psychotronic effect? I would. Uh huh. Um, because I do think that their belief is wrapped up in that、mm-hmm. to some extent,、yeah. as well as their studies.、Mm-hmm. But but it's really difficult because did they study a cube? Did they study a sphere? Is there something special about the pyramid?、Yeah. Everyone was ecstatic to look at the ancient pyramids and realize there's a bunch of these all over the earth from、mm-hmm. different civilizations.、Yeah. What was that really all about? I don't think it was just burial grounds.、Mm-hmm. There's something more. Now I tend to think the pyramids were initiation chambers.、Mm. Uh, Been inside the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid, where there's a sarcophagus. I've been in the sarcophagus. Other people with me were in that sarcophagus, and almost to a person. In fact, I don't know of any exceptions really. People report a very particular altered state of consciousness when you're in that particular sarcophagus. It's the feeling of Floating through outer space, you're out amongst the stars. Wow! And、uh, it seems to me that,、uh, conventionally speaking, engineers and conventional scientists try to completely discount that their attitudes, their consciousness, would have any effect on their results, on their experiments, and on their equipment.、Uh, That it, it should make no difference whatsoever, but in fact, w- there are many, many, many examples of、uh, how people's consciousness does affect、uh, the equipment. There are some people who they walk into a room and the equipment will stop working. Yes, yes, or yeah, break down, and <laughs>、mm-hmm. uh, that does concern me. And I get phone calls from people like that a lot. I don't want to invite them to my laboratory. <laughs> <laughs> So we know that the the human machine interface is is far more complex than normally acknowledged. Exactly,、mm-hmm. and of course that was the the study of Robert John and Brenda Dunn for so many years at the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab. Oh yes, because the engineers were concerned about. Uh, I can imagine, especially the aerospace industry, subtle interactions between、mm-hmm. the intents and、uh, expectations and feelings of pilots, and、mm-hmm. how instrumentation might、uh, change. So they found effects on random number generators、mm-hmm. that were、uh, small, a few bits in ten thousand, but highly reproducible over many operators over many years.、Mm-hmm. Uh, they found. Uh, reliability in those scores.、Mm-hmm. So operators、uh, thinking about higher higher numbers got higher numbers, and operators thinking about lower numbers got lower numbers,、yeah. and that's how that works. Well, and those random event generators or random number generators、uh, are based on quantum mechanical principles. They're about as random as is physically possible to create. And to my understanding, they are also at the basis of all of the、uh, slot machines、uh, <laughs> here here in Las Vegas. There's a sense in which the whole city of Las Vegas is a 
a big uh, parapsychology laboratory. <laughs> That's great. Uh-huh. And uh, I know one researcher, Dean Radin, has actually worked with casino managers to see are there correlations between the uh, casino winnings and such things as the phases of the moon. Well, and then I think the geocosmic factor is a whole other thing. And mm -hmm. I do think... Uh, we're being shifted yeah. all the time, and we try to think. We th we tend to think of the universe as pretty stable. The sun is stable. The earth is stable. But actually, the heavenly bodies are whirring through new regions of space time yeah. out there, mm -hmm. and the earth and the sun enter new regions that might have more or less galactic energy. Mm -hmm. And so we could feel something different tomorrow that we didn't feel today. Yep. And the notion of replicability in science, which depends on the sameness, uh, may be a flawed notion. Mm -hmm. In other words, people always say, okay, you got it once, keep replicating. Yeah. But everybody knows the thousandth kiss is not the same as the first kiss. So why do they insist on scientific data being so so like that when life is, is very different? I think we should have expect... Uh, reproducibility in kind, but mm -hmm. not precise replication. And when we push to the limit, then the whole yeah. effects get diluted. People get bored doing experiments. And, and I know that issue of replication is uh, becoming paramount now in the behavioral sciences. Mm. Many, many classic studies in social psychology and uh, psychology and economics and yeah. r related disciplines are uh, not replicable, even though they've been well accepted. And that's certainly true in medicine. Mm -hmm. Every time you turn around, there's a different medical uh, result than there was five years ago, and now you've got to change your mm -hmm. your behavior if you want uh, protection from a certain disease based on the latest research. I mean, for so many years we ate hydrogenated fats, then we turned back to natural fats, etc. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's how it is. I, I, yeah, we get different advice every decade. <laughs> <laughs> What's appropriate? It used to be that uh, fatty foods like cheese were terrible. Now they're good. Now one wonders yeah. how much the belief system of yeah. the people in that time contributed mm -hmm. to those results. Well, no doubt a lot. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's really where psychotronics becomes <laughs> very, very interesting. Exactly. Uh -huh. Well, Dr. Beverly Rubick, what a pleasure to explore this fascinating, exotic, uh, and potentially very important area with you. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. It's my pleasure. And thank you for being with me, and thank you for being with us. On June 1st, we just released issue number two of the New Thinking Aloud quarterly magazine. You can download a free copy at the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website, newthinkingaloud.org.